trees. Very good. Confronting its first recession since independence, the government's economic strike force knew it had to find a way to jolt the economy out of its downward spiral. The economy of a country, even one as small as Singapore, is more like the technique you need to fly a kite. You catch the wind. Now, look, we thought we caught a powerful wind, so the kite rose and we gave it a lot of string and it looked as if it was going to fly away and away up into the clouds. Now the wind has fallen. Now pull back. Wind the reel, tauten, tighten and make taut so you got better control and move and catch the next draft of wind. Costs had to come down across the board if productivity was to be recovered and economic growth stimulated. Wages were a prime target. The Economic Committee bit the bullet and recommended a two years freeze on all wage increases. It was very timely and NWC recommended the cutting down of wages by, I think, 20 odd percent. Yeah, and that, I must mention, when we cut down, uh, it's against international practice. Most countries, have, they don't have this kind of practice. Cutting down wages, unthinkable. Uh, and our cutting down means from the president, Chief Justice, the Prime Minister, uh, everybody. There were tears around. People just don't know what is going to happen to them tomorrow if you lose your job. And, and then you, you, you cast back your mind to, is it not better if we take a pay cut? If 10 people can each take a 10% pay cut, as an example. Then one of the 10 does not need to be retrenched. Everybody will be taking a proportionate reduction in pay. This applies to everybody, from myself down to the lowest level janitor in the company. But we personally believe, and we are all committed that this is a far better way of attacking the problem than retrenchment. It was a situation where if you really let people go, they had no alternative employment because it was the entire economy. The government didn't only freeze wages. It also introduced major wage reforms to make the system more flexible and reactive to downturns in the economy. It is better in the next few years for us to move away from a single wish guideline or even a range of wish recommendations for managements and workers. Let managements and workers negotiate on what the wages should be for their industries, for their sectors, for their companies. The new wages policy tested the strength of the tripartite relationship between the government the workers and the employers. The government appealed to the workers that these reforms were more than just cost-cutting measures at their expense. They argued that sacrifices had to be made now in a demonstration of collective will by all the parties to win back investor confidence and stem the flow of further jobs from Singapore. Trust, keeping the faith, before 1985, although we already had tripartism for a good 12, 13, 14 years in the, in the name of NWC, 1985 was the turning point, the point where had the employers not kept the faith, had the government not kept the faith, tripartism would have disappeared. The wage restraints and reform was a major success. 
143,000 workers from 950 companies took to the streets to demonstrate their support for the government's call for wage restraint. It was a remarkable gesture of solidarity with the employers and a boost to their determination to ride out the tough times that were besieging the economy. In August 1985, new charges by five statutory boards were announced that saved businesses a total of $120 million, a massive help in such troubled times. Corporate and personal tax were also reduced from 40% down to 30% to bring Singapore into line with its regional competitors. It was a major step in restoring business confidence. Everybody would always like to see things sooner and quicker. I think the thing that encourages me is the willingness of the government to be realistic, to look at the situation as it exists and try to do something about it. With the recession continuing to bite, the Economic Committee took a deep breath and began considering attacking some sacred cows. None were more sacred than the Central Provident Fund. It is the nest egg of last resort. The Central Provident Fund may have been considered by most Singaporeans to be untouchable. It was their security blanket for the future. But it had become a major cost to employers and businesses' ability to survive the recession. The idea of CPL was created to fund HDB, so that people can use the savings to buy housing, right? So the idea is that when you increase the wages, right, the government views that you increase the wages, the working on money is spent, free inflation, put out in CPF. So the idea was to increase the workers' wages, yes, double digit, but the money went to CPF and deductions. What happens is that that 50% of this belongs to the workers. The union are very happy. But union, who pays the workers' salary? Not the union, the company. Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew was against CPF cuts. The Economic Committee's chairman, Lee Hsien Lung, was also initially opposed to any change to the CPF rates. Assuming you earn $2,000, right? You know that uh, you have $1,000 going into your CPF account. That $1,000 attracting good uh, interest went a long way towards the provision of, our, of servicing our housing loans, our medicine, and our retirement age. So when you scale that down, it is never taken uh, lightly. The government's economic committee opened debate on possible cuts to the CPF. Throughout 1985, it also continued to search for structural solutions to beat the recession. Over a thousand people were now working under its direction to get the answers it was looking for. While tough decisions were being made and implemented by its leaders, Singapore suffered another hit. Electric is in receivership. Pan Electric was the darling of the stock market. Everybody was looking to it, and then all of a sudden it was heading down. And not only down, it collapsed. And then it was in receivership, and everybody was like in panic. Oh my God, what's happened? Share prices on the Singapore Stock Exchange went into freefall when news got out that Pan Electric was in receivership. And the word gets around that this broker is selling, that broker is selling, everybody starts selling. So there is no stock. Then it goes into a very steep decline. And it's very scary if you're watching the market. Wow, what's happening? Like today, the index is down 5%, 6%, 7%. Every minute is heading down. Yeah? The fall of Pan Electric was the biggest corporate failure to threaten the stock exchange of Singapore. Panel had 70 subsidiaries and owed 400 million to various debtors. When it fell, the value of its shares plummeted from $1.46 to as low as $0.10 cents at one time. To forestall this threat to the stability of the whole securities market, the Stock Exchange of Singapore closed the exchange, a move unprecedented in its 12-year history. It is very unusual. In fact, I would go so far as to say that even during the crash of 29, 
Wall Street didn't close. And I think the British stock market closed for one day when the, the Germany declared war on Britain in 1939. My dad is a blue-collar worker, the bus driver who worked for Singapore Bus Services. My father got into financial trouble because he was affected by the pan electric crisis. Ken's father had invested his life savings in pan electric and lost it all. Out of shame, he never told his family how much he had lost, but it changed everything. And that really started to impact and drastically change my family life, especially on the financial aspect of it. Things become tough, really tough. We went through a period where there's basically no, uh, no electricity. <laughs> it was cut off because no money to pay the bill. Um, my grandma have actually to come out to really to support because my grandma is a porridge seller to help my dad to uh, shoulder some of the debt. Me and my brother started working uh, pretty early. Uh, I started working at the age of 13 years old while I was going to school uh, just to actually make enough uh, money to actually repay, to clear the debt. The stock market chaos added urgency to the government's mission to protect Singapore's economy in 1985. They had decided on the immediate reforms to recover it, but they needed to find major structural solutions to future-proof the economy long-term, if the country was to ever survive such upheavals again. 